Hey everybody, coming back at you with a, another semi-exciting edition of Fun in the Woods. Uh, a couple of videos back I did a video, uh, Five Tips for the Beginning Wild Camper. And uh, in that video I showed one machete and one axe, but I didn't say much about it. Now, the response to that was, uh, people were interested, I got a few messages, uh, people saying that they were more interested in machetes and axes, especially for the beginner, in the chopping aspect of it. So, uh, there's a lot of safety involved, a lot of inherent dangers with chopping tools, so I thought they'd be good to go over and do a uh, chopping, the complete guide to chopping tools for the beginner. And even for those of you that are more experienced, maybe you'll pick up a few tips here and there. So, uh, we're going to go over some stuff here in the gear room before we go out into the field and actually do a little bit of chopping, get out there and swing an axe, swing a machete, have a little fun. <laughs> so, before that, a little bit of information that may help you with your pack out or your load out or knowing what to carry is whether you're a bushcrafter or a camper or a survivalist, your tools are going to be classified in two different categories. There's going to be contact tools and impact tools. Okay. Now, basically, uh, contact tools are fairly safe. You can get hurt, hurt with them, but they're 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 fairly safe. Now, a contact tool is a knife. Okay. A knife is always in basically in contact with the work. Okay. There are exceptions. A folding saw, bow saw, or buck saw is a contact tool because you are basically in contact with the work. All right, so you have control, more control over these. An axe or a machete is considered an impact tool because the way it works is by impact. Now. <clears throat> The inherent dangers of these axes and machetes and things and the efficiency, like I said, it leads to inherent dangers. So there's things that you need to know, especially if you're a beginner. So we're going to go over these things. Uh, not much of a reason to talk about saws or knives uh, unless there's a whole lot of response for it. But <laughs> what we're going to do is we're going to go over machetes first, uh, a couple of different styles, the different styles of axes, and then a few thoughts on both types of tools, and then we'll go out into the field. All right, so let's get into it. The typical machete that most people are used to and have seen is just what is called the bush machete. And this is just typically a machete, and most of the ones that you'll see are usually these Ontario machetes, and sometimes they're called a camp machete, and sometimes they're called a military machete. And uh, these are not really wood choppers, but you can use them as wood chopper, choppers. A lot of these Ontarios come in 12 inch, 18 inch, and 22 inch. And uh, they're more meant for grass, vines, thorns, vegetation, bushes, things like that. Not necessarily wood choppers. But uh, these are usually what they call Latin style machetes or bush machetes. This is an Ontario, and it has the typical Ontario handle, and it's got a saw back. You can't really saw much with it, but it's good for notches, and it's good for making dust, if you want dust for shavings. Here's another Ontario. It's got the smooth back, but it has what's called the D handle, and that's for protection to keep you from smashing your fingers on certain things. Condor makes a stainless steel machete. For wet environments or if you're in the swamps or the wetlands or if you're going to be like busting coconuts or chopping bananas, <laughs> you got a stainless steel version. For grass and vines, K-Bar makes one that is called a, a grass machete. It doesn't quite have the length of the big K-Bar, but this thing has a grind on it that is called a duplex grind where it has a relief and another relief and then the cutting angle. And so these, you don't have to worry about it. These things can be kept razor sharp. See if I can see. Yeah, you can see right there. It has a relief here and a relief here. 
and then it's got the final bevel on the bottom. And these things can be kept to a razor, razor sharp edge for cutting for uh, grass and vines and things. So those are your general bush machetes. So now we're going to move on to the next style of machete. The next style of machete is called a kukri. And the kukri originated in Nepal. Now the kukri is very, um, how should I say, you, you, it's, it's unmistakable the shape because it has this downward curve to the top of it and normally there's two different reasons for that and it depends on people's opinion but one of them the reason that this is curved like this is because it will the blade will arrive on the work before your hand because you see right here if you're chopping in a fashion like this the blade will arrive before your hand and there's room right here the other reason is then instead of having a blade come straight down on the work that if it's angled it'll almost give it a scissor action and allow it to embed in the wood better but I don't really buy into that as much as I do as it being this way now because there's other machetes that are weight forward but they don't have this bend to them now the distinction of a machete of, of a kukri is it has three distinct parts the point and the tip here is for slicing and incising and piercing. The curved part is for chopping, the, the bow down part. And then the curved up part up here is for carving and whittling. So that's the three distinct features of it. This one is from uh, Ex Gurkha House, uh, imported from, the, from, the, from Nepal. So uh, K-Bar makes a version of it. And this is more modern version. It looks tactical looking with the, the uh, rubber, uh, I think it's a craton handle. Very, very good grip on it. And it has the distinctive down drop with the curve like this. And uh, <clears throat> there's lots of kukris out there. This is one that I got recently from Hanshu Boshing. And uh, it's a stainless steel machete. It's hollow ground. And it has the distinctive drop in it with the belly and the curve and the point. So they, those are those are kukris right there. And that's that's the distinction of them is that drop. All right. I talked much about uh, sheaths. So <clears throat> some of these other sheaths, it d doesn't really matter. These are just, these are basic sheaths like the one that this came with. I attached a knife to it with a little bit of paracord. Uh, same thing for the K-Bar, I attached a little knife to it, but the distinct, those are things that I did. But in general, the Kukri will come with two smaller knives. Now, I feel like this, this warrants a little bit of information here because a lot of times whenever you hear reviews on these things, uh, they'll get the machete and it'll be in a sheath like this. Now, whenever you put a, 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 a um, machete in a sheath like this, sheaths like this that are partially open you put the blade in and slide it in just like that and then sort of drop it down you kind of it's sort of a in and down motion and then you cl you you clip it but on these type that are solid you want to put your hand on top and when you when you when you put your machete in or take it out you want to put up pressure on it don't put down pressure on it because you may cut into the sheath. So what you do is when you get it started in, like I said, put up pressure on it to try to keep that blade from dragging across the bottom. And like when I pull it out, I'm pushing up on it. Now about these two little knives, I've seen reviews where people complain that they say one of the knives is dull. Well, that's on purpose. That's, that's not a mistake. Let me, let me walk a little bit closer. Because what this is is this one is sharpened to use as a small knife and then one of them will be dull see how dull that is now the reason for that is is if you want to you can sharpen this as a knife but you can leave it dull to use it for flint and steel fire making so that's the reason why one of them is dull right there I just wanted to clarify that that that's that's a reason and there's some uh, Nepalese names for these two, and I 
They have separate names and I forgot what they're called. You can look them up if you want to. <laughs> Next machete style is a parang. Now a parang originated in either Indonesia or Malaysia. Not real sure. So this one I've attached a mora to the sheath. This is a condor. Now the parang is a wood chopping beast. I feel like if it was uh, if somebody told me you can take one tool out to build a shelter and stay warm by a fire. It would be the, the, the parang. It is a chopping beast. Now, the characteristics of this thing is basically it's weight forward and it has this curve to it at the top and a curve at the bottom. And like I said, if you can see right here, the blade arrives before the hand. All right, kind of a safety feature. Now, this is a condor parang, condor bushcraft parang. That's one version of it. Uh, this is a Condor Village Parang. Comes in a sheath, leather sheath, and I've added a, a, a Condor knife to it. This one has a curve to the back part. This one is just ground into a point. That's the way most Parangs are. Not a lot of Parangs are curved like this. In some, in some cases, some people when it's got a curve consider this to be an a go lock. A go lock is similar to a parang. I've got one that's labeled as a go lock. I'm going to show in a minute. But most of these, none of these are ground that I know of. None of these are ground flat. They're all uh, concave ground. That way they won't stick in the wood because it's not really a cutting or slicing tool. This is a chopping tool. All right, and that's that's what keeps it from sticking in the wood. Han Shu Ba Shing, which I had the kukri from they also make a parang now with this one i have added a folding saw where this way it is a complete kit i have my contact tool and then i have my impact tool so but this isn't ground like your average parang this is hollow ground so i don't use this for much heavy wood processing i only use this for like where i'm going to be doing small wood processing and vines and grass and whatever I'm in like swamps or wetlands so this it then this thing holds an edge pretty good and uh, one other honorable mention let me see if I can find it this is this is a version of a parang and I have it paired up with a little knife this is called the condor mini duku now with this thing I like to grab the sheath and give it a squeeze as I'm pulling it out and same thing, I'm pushing it up. But that's a very, very small, small. It's a, a Dooku machete, but it is considered to be a parang. Now, this is one of the kind that you don't need a lanyard because you want to pay attention to the, some of these machetes and the shape of the handle. That if your hands are wet or muddy or it's snowing or they're sweaty, you like to have a, a, a I don't know what you would call this, a pommel maybe so that you don't have to put a death grip on it and it won't necessarily slide out of your hand so those are parangs style is the bolo machete now in my opinion what is considered a traditional bolo I don't have you have to look it up online but a, a bolo is a machete that has it's very hard to say it's it's straight and it has a huge curve on the end, and, the, and it comes back up and over. Normally, bo bolos don't come to a sharp point. This is an Ontario SP-53. Now, they sell this. It's categorized as a bolo knife. But like I said, in my opinion, this is not a traditional bolo. The bolos, I think, came from, I think, Indonesia, I think. And... Uh, but I haven't seen them with a sharp point. So, but they sell this as a bolo. That is a beast of a blade. That is a fantastic cutting, cutting tool. This thing here is an IC cut machete. And some call this a bolo and some call it a, some call it a kukri. But the thing about it is, is yes, it has a little bit of a drop to it. It has the curve here that comes up. 
but there's no distinctive break in it. It's all one curvy line. So some call that a bolo. But the thing is, uh, Charade makes a blade that they sell, and they call it a kukri. Now the thing about this kukri right here is it's about the same shape. It kind of drops down. It doesn't have a distinctive drop. It has the curve with the point in this part under here. And if you can look at that, see these two are these two are similar. And some sell this one on the bottom as a kukri. Some sell it as a bolo. This top one they claim that's a kukri. And as you can see, this is you know they, they call that a kukri, but they call that a bolo. So <laughs> I just want to say I want to make clear that the manufacturers kind of warp the meaning of what some of these are but you know regardless of what you call this it's a fantastic blade so you can look at it more and do a little bit more research on it on the the bolo a minute ago i misspoke on the bolo uh the bolo originated in the philippines not indonesia <laughs> the golok is a machete style it originated in either indonesia malaysia or the philippines <laughs> But the thing is, is a go lock, some go locks look like this. They have a big old curved edge on them like this, and some don't. Now, I've been told in the past, people get go locks and parangs confused, and I'm not real sure, and there's a lot of different opinions out there, especially since all the different knife and machete manufacturers have warped the actual definition of what some of these blades are. But my guess is, is that the go lock is curved like this and curves all the way up to the point. Parangs often have a flat cutoff on the end instead of a curve. All right, and this the, the, the cutting edge is one one swoop all the way up. So this is con this is a Condor Pack go lock. So a go lock is another style of machete. Another style is called a coping machete. Now this is an Ontario SP8 and I've added a small knife to it. can't remember what that is but that's a stainless steel knife that I use for food prep. Uh, this one the sheath opens up this way and the blade comes out like this. Now a coping machete is one that has a flat end. Now they claim that a coping machete is set up as a search and rescue type machete. And what that means is, because of the flat end, you can bust windows out, and you can cut people, you can cut seat belts, and you can cut people and pry things to extract people from mangled cars, or even aircraft. You could pry open the door of the aircraft. This thing is quarter inch thick. It's got the Creighton handle. It has a little dip here where you can choke up on it has a kind of a what I consider a worthless saw back on the back because it's just got ribs but I don't know that won't cut wood that great maybe it's meant for ripping through seat belts I don't know maybe there's a use for it but when it's flat on the end and Ontario is not the only one that makes a coping machete but if you ever see one that's just flat on the end like this that's considered a coping machete I guess because you're coping with disaster <laughs> The next style of machete is called a panga, P-A-N-G-A, -A, panga. Now the panga originated in Africa. This is a more modern tactical version of the panga. They make more traditional versions like Collins, uh, Marbles, uh, Imakasa. There's a bunch of different traditional makers of it. But what makes a panga what it is, is it has the curve all the way to the point. And then the back curves up to a point. Now this is this one is made by Timberline Tactical, and this is definitely a more modern version of it because on the back it has a glass breaker. On the top it has the most aggressive saw back I've ever seen in my life back here. And then it has some serrations built into the tip here. It has more serrations here, and then it has a cord cutter. So that's the panga. When it curves up like that, that is considered a panga. Originated in Africa. Now this is, you know, th this is the type of machete that was, yes, it's for vines and grass and vegetations, but it's also designed for, for light wood cutting. 
So that's how this differs from the classic bush machete. Textile is pronounced two different ways. In Old English, this is pronounced siax. Uh, in Old Norse, this is pronounced sax, S-A-X. But we're most, the general acceptance of this is S-E-A-X, siax. Uh, this is just kind of hard to describe. It has quite a long handle kind of flat on the top with the drop with just a slight curve to it. It's just a distinctive shape. Now this is the, the like I said, I think this is made in Finland. This is a Tarava Skrama. And what makes this a distinctive chopper as compared to the others is to me what makes manufacturers have warped due to the length of these blades. What is a machete and what isn't a machete. And so, when you have, to me, when you have a machete, the full blade length of it would be about 25 to 30 degrees ground. Whereas a knife is between 17 to 23 or 24 degrees, which is more of a, it is more of a steeper angle, which could roll an edge, it could roll over when you're chopping. So they make it a little bit, you know, a little bit more, uh, what do you call it? I don't know if that's obtuse or acute. I failed math. <laughs> but what makes this distinctive is what they have done with this. So let's see if I can zoom in on this. Tarava has gone from here to here with 34 degrees. And then right here, there's about an inch and a half section here that they have ground that is 20 five degrees. Now I don't know if you can see that distinction in it. If I turn it the right way maybe you can. But the beauty of that thing is is that is what and that's why some people call a sax or siax. Some call it a big knife, some call it a machete. But that is a distinction on this one. Now let's just say for example let me pull down another knife here. Uh, right here. This is the Ontario Artac 2. Look at the size of it. This is considered, this is sold as a knife. Alright. So let's put, now, uh, let's see, this is sold as a bolo knife too. So let me show you something here real quick. Uh, let me find another one. What am I looking for? Okay, let's go with this. This is a K-Bar Cutlass. Now the K-Bar Cutlass, I don't know what it is. It might be considered a bolo too. So let's say this. Let's say that most people accept this as a machete. Well, look at the length of the handle and the length of the blade. See, they're almost identical, if not even maybe even a little bit longer, about identical on the length. But for some reason, this is accepted as a machete, and this is accepted as a knife. If you're going to bring a knife as a chopper, let's say for example, this whole blade has got 22 degrees to it. If you're going to use this as a chopping tool. I would suggest that somewhere's around about two or three inches here. When you start sharpening this as it gets dull in the future, from here to here, you could sharpen this at about 30 degrees, so it'll be a little more blunt. You could do more chopping. Leave this about 20 to 25, and then if, if you wanted to get crazy with it, the very tip, make it 17 degrees, <laughs> because you're not going to be chopping with the tip. You'll use it for slicing. Of course, the further out you get, the more power you can put into it. Like when you're chopping right here, you're not going to have much power. But if you're chopping that on the end. So it all depends on you, how you grind it, and how you use it. So, anyway, <clears throat> I think I have covered all the different styles. That was the last style that I was going to cover. Uh, one more thing that I want to say about some of this stuff here. Let me find some of these. If you have a handle... Let's take a peek right here in a minute. If you have a handle that has a whole lot back here to keep it from slipping out of your hand, that's great. You may not need a lanyard. If you have one that hasn't got much there, then you do need a lanyard. Some machetes, this is a Columbia River, Columbia River Knife and Tool, CRKT. Look how ergonomic shaped this handle is molded. That would be very hard for that to slip out of your hands if your hands were wet or muddy or you were sweating. But the thing is, you don't want to have to put a death grip 
on these things. If you're going to be chopping all day, uh, there's a way of using this lanyard. Try to put a lanyard on your machetes. Now, whenever you see people that put their hand through this, like this, and just hang on to it and just hold it like that, that lanyard does very, very little. Unless you're in your canoe or kayak or you're on the edge of a cliff, you know, uh, hanging off a cliff or a mountain and, and you know, you don't want to drop it. Or, or if you're like, you know, cutting some berries and then you want to just drop it and continue cutting berries. You want to be able to chop for hours without, without tiring out your grip. So the way you do this is you're going to, in every, every machete handle and everybody's hands are different. So the way you want to do this is you want the blade turned around backwards and you put it on your thumb and then you just roll the machete up just like that. And see how that's on there? That way you don't have to have a death grip. You can just kind of flop when you're chopping. All right. You want flopping while you're chopping. <laughs> because if you're going to put a, a death grip on it, you're going to get tired quick. So that's one way of doing it right there. Another thing you can do is whenever you have it on your thumb like that, you can just flip it up like that, which is pretty cool. Put it on your hand backwards, just like that. Flip it up. Now the other thing that you can do is you can lay it on top like this. Lay your lanyard on top and then pull the two pieces under. And then you can slide your hand in just like this. And see, that'll... That'll lock the machete in too. It's not as fast, but that'll hold it in right there, just like that. Alright. And then the other thing you can do, let's see. Let's see, there's the that's the over. You can go over the blade like this to grip it. Let's see. Or you can go under the blade and just put your hand through it like that. Either way it'll hold. But both of those take a little bit of bumbling. This is my favorite way right here because you know you just you pull the machete. Sometimes you can even pull the machete out of your sheath. You can just reach up there and grab that and flop it out and you're good to go. So I think that's all I was going to cover on the machetes. Uh, so let's move on to the axes and hatchets and uh, camp axes, all right? Axes are basically, for us bushcrafters, survivalist campers, there's basically three axes. There's the full size and then the medium size, which is either called a boy's axe or camp axe, and then there's a hatchet. You can get a little bit crazy with it. You can call them forest axes or cruiser axes or whatever. So, but I'm just going. This is this is the the beginner's guide to chopping tools. So, <laughs> I'm just going to stick with that. Now, most axes come with a protective leather cover, and they are called a mask. All right, that's that's the axe lingo. Uh, <clears throat> axe heads come in all different kind of shapes and sizes, and generally there is a double bit and a single bit. All right, that's considered a single bit. This is considered a double bit. This is a full size axe. It can really take down a tree quick. It can buck up a bunch of wood quick. But who wants to carry this when you're backpacking or hiking? All right, so not a whole lot. I got two other full size. I only own three full size axes, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go over that a whole lot. Uh, as far as a boy's axe, this actually has a belt loop to it. Alright, so let's pull this out. The way this thing does, this is a boy's axe or a camp length axe. And when you have a double head like this, it's good to have a single head for like beating on, uh, beating tent stakes in and stuff. But you've only got one cutting edge. When you have a double bit like this, you can have one between 23 and 25 degrees for chopping. And then you can have the other side about 30 degrees for splitting wood. You want a little bit different angle for splitting wood. So, And if you ever see an axe like this where there's a little bitty short lanyard on there, one of the old tricks is, is that whenever 
whenever you're on a hillside or uneven ground or whenever trees, this is what really will throw you off. If trees are leaning one way or another and there's trees everywhere and one sure way of making sure of which way a tree is leaning if you're on uneven ground and you can't get your bearings is they'll put a little short one on there and what they'll do is they'll hold that axe up just like this and gravity will allow the axe to be straight and what you'll do is you'll side in on a tree to see which way a tree is leaning if you're going to fail a tree now generally us bushcrafters campers and survivalists <laughs> will either chop up what's on the ground and that's usually the best thing to do for like if you're shelter building or especially if you're burning firewood you want dead dry wood you're not going to go after green wood so anyway um let's see uh oh we got another one here <clears throat> this is a council tools boys axe now like i said all heads just as there's go locks parangs bolos pangas Heads are different. This is considered a Hudson Bay head. All right. There's Hudson Bays, there's Dayton's, there's Michigan's. There's all different kind of styles. There's a whole bunch of different styles. And a lot of them are named after states. Why, I don't know. So, uh, one thing I want to go over real quick about this. Here's another small one. This is a Marble 701. To me, that is a perfect, perfect backpacker's axe because of the length of the handle. So... The flatter a blade is, the more it is for soft wood. The more curved a blade is, the more it is for hardwood. Right? So, and then I have uh, a couple of more things I want to go over here. I want to talk about hatchets here for a minute. Hatchets are inherently the most dangerous tool in the woods. Now, why would I say that? Well, I would say that simply because... If you have a boy's axe, camp axe, or full-size axe, in general, you have both hands on the axe, I mean on the, uh, on the wood. The only thing you got to worry about is your feet or your legs. A lot of people, when they're using a hatchet, tend to use it with one hand, which a lot of times you're going to hold the wood, which is stupid. And I'm going to go over this later because you're, you're going to have your hand near where you're cutting. So, if you have two hands on a cutting tool, a chopping tool, it is a much safer tool. Now, <clears throat> this is a hatchet, and this is a Hudson Bay head, too. Now, here's the thing that's kind of, I find odd, that a lot of you will experience. This is a council tool hatchet. This is a council tool boy's axe. Now, look at the difference. They have the exact same head. So, honestly, it's up to you whether or not you want to carry a hatchet or a boy's axe. And like I said, this is generally a one-handed tool. This is a two-handled tool. You could say, well, I can choke up on this and use it, but I'm going to carry this because I can use it two-handed or I can choke up on it like this. Well, when you've got all this here, be, be warned. If you start doing some stupid stuff like holding this while you choke up on this, as you come down, you tend to maybe bump yourself, which could cause the axe to veer off into a fashion that you don't want it to happen. This, I think, the way this curve is, it's similar to a Michigan axe, but I'm not sure. That's a plum axe right there. But that would be good for a lot of wood processing and driving in tent stakes and stuff. Uh, these handles, these handles, you don't want any kind of varnish or anything on them. You want boiled linseed oil on them to keep from rubbing hot spots on. Some people treat them with wax. This jewel here is from Spain. This is a Basque axe from the Basque region of Spain. And I'm fixing to show you what makes this different from other axes. This is nicknamed the moon bit. All right. This has a lot of curve to it because in the Basque region, there's a lot of hardwoods. Uh, this is imported by a company called Lamina and there is only one Basque axe maker left in the world. And I think with the advent I think with, it's an art, he's an artesian axe maker. These are hand forged. And it's a guy in Spain. And there's a company called Lamina that imports these. And uh, so these are very special tools. And, you know, with the advent of technology and chainsaws and, and modern logging, 
you can't have a bunch of people running around with axes in the logging industry. So most of the old artesian axe makers have died off and gone away, but there's still one guy left. And I cannot pronounce this. If you look under lamina, you'll find these, but it's like, I don't know, Warren Harahuna Huna something. I, I don't know. And the axe head itself says Uneta. I don't know what that means. But anyway, these things are great for hardwood. This is an absolute joy to chop with. We're going to take this out in the woods and chop with it a little bit. But the distinction of this is the shape of the head and the way it's mounted. All right. These are common, a regular axe, let's see, uh, <clears throat> a regular axe like this has got a flat part on the back. They call that a pole. And you can beat on things with it. This is rounded in the back. You don't want to be beating on it. And this is forged. And this thing, the way it's mounted is different. This axe, the more you chop with it, the tighter the handle gets. So here's a spare handle for a boy's axe. All right. The hole in the axe is called the eye. Now the way this head is made is it slides on the handle and then you drive a wedge. See how it's got a split in it? I don't know if you can see that or not because it's painted black, but there's a wedge in there. Maybe one of these others has it. Yeah, there's one. This has a round wedge in it. But most of the standard axes you'll see in the world are put on this way, the handle's tapered, it's put on this way, and then a wedge is driven in it to lock it in. The way the basque axe varies is the, the head goes on from this end and slides all the way up just like a tomahawk. Because see how much larger this is, how tapered it is out on the end? So that's what a, that's, that's a basque axe right there. The more you use it, the more you sling out on it, the, the more pressure pushes out and it tightens up against it. So, I think I've covered all the basics on this stuff without getting real crazy. There's a lot more on axe terminology, but, you know, pretty much I kind of I kind of went over the basics of what I think you need to know. So, with that said, let's uh, head on out into the woods and chop a little bit and have some fun. <laughs> I remembered after I had cut the camera off, there was a, I did not go over the actual chopping process before we went out into the field. So there's some things that you have to know when it comes to the chopping process. When you grab something, whether it's a machete or an axe, and you swing and you chop, that's the chopping process. But <clears throat> how that blow is utilized is in two different ways. There is the shear action, and then there is the chip removal action. So... Real quick like without getting too too technical. <laughs> Let's ease down here and take a look so you can see what I'm saying. Now, whether it's an axe or a machete, certain certain diameters you can come down you can come down with one swoop and cut. Okay. Lift this up just a little bit. One swoop, come down and cut clean through. Now when you cut clean through something that is the shear action because you are shearing, you are shearing the material apart. All right. Now, when you get up to certain diameters, you're going to get up to certain diameters like this that you're going to need a full size axe. That if you're chopping with a machete like this, you're going to have to have a bunch of length so that you can come down and shear that material. Some hatchets, especially this little bitty lightweight marbles here, you won't be able to shear with that. But that's the shearing process. Now, when it comes to the chopping process, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to come up with a, a V. Okay? So if you've got a V from the top, and then a V from the bottom, and then the wood breaks apart, that is a V process. If you're going to cut from one side, look how big the V is going to be. Now here's the thing about this. Okay? If you're going to get down, if you're going to cut, especially with certain logs. Now, some logs you're going to lay on top of other logs, and you'll see that out in the field. But whenever you come across a big tree that's been already down, and it's dead and dry, if you're going to get down on your knees with a hatchet and chop into it, you're going to wind up with a super wide V like this. Now, if that log is small enough 
that you can roll it over, your best bet is going to be to chop it this way and then roll the log over and then chop it this way. So you're going to have a V. You're going to have a double V. All right. And the idea behind that is, is if you do this, whether it's a full size axe or a little size axe, when you get down to the bottom, you may wind up cutting into the ground and nicking your blade, which you don't want. Okay. But with some logs, you know, a lot of people have under the misconception that if you've got a big log, you're going to cut down here. Well, if you're going to do that, because you can't roll the log around, you're going to have to do it like this. In reality, what you're going to do is you're going to turn it. If you've got a really big log that you can't roll, then you're going to do the double V. And the process for that is not necessarily chopping on the top, but what you're going to do is stand behind the log, and you're going to chop a V this way, and then you're going to stand behind the log, and you're going to chop a V this way. See, that way you're not chopping straight down and into the ground and making the V excessively wide. So that is the difference between shear action and chip removal. And as you're doing the chip removal, you want to remove as big as chips as possible. So I think that's all I wanted to say now. I had everything wrote down, but that I didn't write down. That was just the thought occurred to me. But <laughs> I mean, that's the basic mechanics of chopping. Okay, the two different processes. So now let's go out into the field. <laughs> so we finally made it out into the woods. Well, what's left of the woods? <laughs> All right, we're going to do some chopping techniques. And this is an area that was uh, halfway clear cut. And as you can see, they've left a huge mess behind. And this is not a good place for a camper, but this is an absolute excellent place for a uh, chopping stuff having fun with axes and machetes so what we're going to do is we're going to go out here and learn some good old chopping techniques because i have plenty of material to choose from <laughs> first things first safety whenever you're doing this kind of chopping stuff uh grab you some safety glasses protect the old eyes because you don't know where the chips are going to be flying anywhere and wear boots don't wear flip-flops. <laughs> wear some kind of heavy leather boots. Now, to start with, uh, there was a technique <clears throat> on another video from a guy that when it comes to chopping with a machete, you, you may have seen this, and, and I don't agree with it. And I'm not going to say who it is because two different people did it, and they, they're supposed to know machetes. So. I, I mean, you can do it this way if you want to, but I'm going to show you something that I don't care for. Uh, now, <clears throat> when they did it, they were concerned with safety, which is a good thing. And the, it was some of the safety techniques that they were talking about. And so they were talking about laying... Like this, they were talking about laying the, this back here and chopping like this. Now that's great because you're not going to swing and hit yourself in the leg. But my only problem with that, and be forewarned, you know, if you're in great shape, you know, do it if you want to. But to me, the unnatural motion of twisting and swinging like this, when you're twisted, Twisting your spine is terrible. That is not a good thing to do. So, in my guess, what you need to do is the trees, I mean the forest, are they are full of down logs. So what I would suggest you would do is find you a down log to chop with. Now, if you've got something small enough, this will be the shear technique. Because see, it's shearing straight through. But now as you see, did you just hear that? Uh, hit the tripod. I was just talking about, about uh, the little pieces flying everywhere when I was chopping them. You're not trying to cover your area with little pieces of wood. You're trying to cut little pieces of wood for, you know, probably your twig stove or camp stove or whatever. So one of the best ways of collecting these, I'm fixing to show you. 
find you a tree just like this where you can aim the wood down and so what you're going to do is then is you're going to straddle this this tree here and what you're going to do is you're going to cut them and as you cut them they're going to shoot down to the ground so i'm going to move some of this stuff out of the way or at least in theory it's supposed to no so much for that i got one of them to land on the ground <laughs> Uh, but anyway, that's the theory. And another thing, too, is that you can aim which way. Let me find another one of these. Here, here's one. Another thing is you can aim which way by going down or up or in an angle like that. Now, they're all pretty much landing in one place. Now, I'm going to try to cut them like this. Okay, now they all pretty much landed in a place like that. Depending, you're going to have to experiment with the angle. But what you can do is you can chop up a whole pile of this kind of stuff here in no time to feed your little uh, twig stove. And these will burn longer than actual twigs. So, all right, now moving on to the next step. Now let's say that you're going to move on along to a point like this. So, with this, you're not out here just chopping randomly for absolutely no reason. You're wanting to uh, create firewood or do something for a shelter. So, if you get to a point where right here it gets this big, maybe, this may be about the limit of what you can shear. Now, if I cut it here, I don't have as much leverage. See how I sunk it in about halfway? But if I cut it back here, there I did that. But that took a lot of effort. I'm going to try that one more time. I see that I put just the same amount of effort, but it only went in halfway. Now with certain sizes, you could chop one size, flip it over, and chop the other side, and it'll get it off. So let's do that once more. One side, get it undone. The other side, it comes loose. Now, you can see what it does to the wood. In two chops, you can cut it. Now, sometimes that thing will get stuck the first time. So as the wood progressively gets larger, then what you can do is you can start taking... Uh, you can take one chip out. And that's where instead of cutting straight in, I'm going to lean the machete. And we'll cut and cut, and that takes a V out. Once you've got the V out, you can turn it over, and it'll come off. Oh. Let's see, there's part of the V. I cut a V here, and then here's the other half of the V. This is a V and a shear. See how it's got a V? I cut it V here, V here, flip it over, cut through, and shear it. All right, let's see that one more time. Cut the V out. I'm going to flip it over and shear it. See how that looks? A V and a shear. Now let's go to a little bit bigger piece of wood. A much larger piece of wood. Look at that. Look what I just picked up off the ground. When they were out here cutting, they cut this knot off this tree. And look, it's already getting shiny. Look at that. Look at that goo in there. This is already forming fat wood. Look at that goo. I'm going to put that in the truck here at home. That'd be a good piece of fat wood. All right, now back to what we were talking about. There's a certain point that you're going to get to a limit of what you can cut with a machete. Now, this, the Tarava Scrama, is nowhere near as heavy as the, um, the parang I was using. But it has the handle length for leverage. So what I'm going to do, and this is a lot bigger, there's no way that I can cut a V and a V and shear this. So what I'll do in this case...
is cut halfway through it, just like that, and then flip it over because the piece of wood is small enough that I can manage it. Well, the end is all crooked. <laughs> That's great. Let's see if I can do this. Well, I'm gonna have to hold it down here. There you go. I see that. That's a relatively big piece of wood right there that you can cut with a machete. So let's try that one more time. That's the problem with this thing though is I gotta the wood is wanting to be manipulated because it's got a big curve on the end. Hey look a helicopter going over here. See if this was a if this was a survival situation, that's what we'd be wanting. I don't normally this is this is actually too big this is this is getting into machete uh, axe territory but let's see how efficiently I can do this with the Tarava starting to get hard to manage. All right, that is how you work yourself to death. That is the case. See, I'm exhausted now. <laughs> That's about the width bigger than my hand. This is the point of ridiculous to where you really want to go to a hatchet. So I'm gonna take this same piece of wood we're going to move on to a hatchet. I'm going to show you how much more efficient the hatchet is. Now the hatchet itself is actually one of the most dangerous tools there is. And the reason I say that is because it's generally a one-handled handed tool. And the fact that it's so short, people have a tendency to hold on to the work, which puts their hand in the danger zone. So and it's usually best you can kneel down to use a hatchet or if you put your foot far enough away you can just sort of lean over and chop so that's what i'm going to try to do here i'm going to try to let's see here i'm going to try to hold let's put this right here all right i think you can see there all right, I'm going to try to hold them one foot. Now, we're going to see how much more efficient this is. All right. Than the, um, the axe. Now, if you're going to do this with your hand, make sure that your hand is very, very far away for you to do your cutting. But I would rather put my foot with a leather boot on it.
flip it over one more time. Let's see. Now that took, that took a whole lot less effort. I'm old as dirt, <laughs> but it still took le less effort. But it's still a one-handed tool. Now, as far as splitting, there's another thing that I'm going to show you. Splitting is not really a, a chopping procedure, but I'm going to show you the safe way of doing it. Now let's talk a little bit about splitting. Let's say that you've got a piece of wood. People are always going to hold a piece of wood and take it like this and try to split. Well, the thing is, since your hand's there, people tend to not swing with much force. And when they just barely swing, oftentimes they'll tap. It'll bounce off and they'll come straight down. If you swing with a lot of force, what if you miss and you hit your hand? So that's not the way to do it. The best way to split is to lay the ax on the log like this and then come down with the whole thing and have this part touching this because if it's like this, you're gonna come down and smash your thumb. So you wanna do just like this. There it goes. Now once I got the log stuck, Turn this way and see how I got this my hand right here going with it. That's to keep the axe from coming down and smacking my hand. And then you'll break it just like that. And see, and then after that, what you'll do is you've got a nice flat spot on the bottom, so you're going to do the same, or you can just you can just lay it down like this and split just like that. Man, that's some gummy wood. Or, do it the same way and hold it like this. Just like that. And then finish it off by hand. Alright, now let's move on to a boy's axe. Talk a little bit about the, the difference between a boy's axe and a full-size axe when you're talking about handle length and head weight okay now the thing about this type of axe is it's plenty comfortable enough that if I wanted to stand here I could cut with it okay but the thing is there's plenty enough length that if this veers off and I'm standing behind the log then it won't hit my legs if I spread my legs out then this is going to be in the way. Therefore, it leads me with the option of either standing here like this or standing back and taking advantage because I have more length. But that could put a stress on my back. So, let's look at the boy's axe. Now, with the boy's axe, I can stand here and I can barely hold the end. If I spread my legs and keep them out of the danger zone, now you're talking. Now, did you just see that? Did you just see what that just did? My leg was back behind the log and so when it swung my leg was out of the way. It was close, but it was out of the way. Now, see how the axe is right there? The handle is about to hit here. I've cut one side, I've cut the other side, 
whenever I start hitting here, that is when it's time to start cutting from the top down. Now, I have it plenty cleared out, so instead of chopping all the way through into the ground, I'll go back to the shallow side. Now, did you see what I just did with this axe? The Basque axe has a curve to it. It's so short that I don't do the hand motion. I was just holding and chopping. As you can see, it has a nice smooth cut. Effortless. Let's talk a little bit about axe technique. Now, when you're using a boy's axe or a camp axe, the handle's so short, you can just do all your work this way. Without ever using your hand, without moving your hand. Now, proper technique for a full size axe is sliding your hands. Now, I am a machete man. So, my axe technique is terrible. <laughs> so I'm gonna show you the proper way. Now it takes a lot of practice, but I don't use the axe very often, so I'm out of practice. But what you're supposed to do is hold the axe this way, and on this chop, the hand slides. And then on this chop, you swap hands, and this slides. Now that's proper technique. I have got into the bad habit of sliding this hand and then switching over and see how my arms are crossing and doing it like that. And see, that's what happens. Do you see how I just lost it? That's because of the way my arms are crossing. If I was doing using proper technique to where I switched the held hand with the movable hand, that wouldn't happen as much. So, with that said, <laughs> with that said, everybody knows me as a machete man, so that's why my axe technique is so sloppy. <laughs> but I did just show you the proper way. Now one other thing I want to show you is limbing a tree. Once you've felled the tree. And for me I see no reason to fell a tree unless you own the property and you're going to cut down some green logs for a cabin for permanent shelter. If you're just after firewood, there's always wood laying around everywhere. So. I'm going to try to find something to show you limbing for once the tree's failed. This is a pretty good example of a downed tree, whether it was failed or whether you found it in the woods, I've had a limb a tree. And that's, that's how to remove all these limbs. Now, never ever, 
ever take an axe and cut this way. Because if you cut this way, you're going to wedge the axe. The only way that's ever permissible is if you can cut the limb off in one swipe, which would be the shear action. Now there's a little bitty one right there. You can cut that one off with that. Something like this, you may or may not can cut it off in one sweep. So you're going to want to do take chips out of it. And you also always want to stand on the opposite side of the tree. All right. So the technique would be cut in that way and that way. And so what I did is I took a chip out of it. I'm going to bring you in closer so that we can do this one. This would be the improper technique is standing on the same side because I'm, I can bounce off and hit my leg or I can go through and hit here. You want to be on the opposite side of the tree and preferably instead of standing back here you want to stand a little bit forward like maybe even even where the branch is. Okay, so this is a proper side to be on. Improper technique is cutting from this side because you're never going to remove any material and you're not going to shear something of that size. So what you want to do is make the initial shear, take a chip out, see how I just removed it? Make another shear cut and then take a chip out. And that's how you remove a branch. And then you can just clean it up if you want to. See, just like that. Same process with a hatchet but you'll be leaning over a lot more. Just like that. Alrighty, hope you had fun. Hope you learned something. Uh, be safe with your chopping. Watch your fingers. Uh, yeah, saws are more efficient, but they're nowhere near as much fun. So I hope this is a pretty good insight into how I feel about chopping tools and what I think they can do for you. So till the next one, hope you learned something. Hope you had fun. Get out and enjoy life. Hopefully, you can find a wasteland like this where <laughs> you can chop to your heart's content. And we shall see you in the next one. Thank you, beauty.